some thoughts on four by Miles Davis. Module 2-2, two, two, form of this tune being an A, B, A, C form. Each bar, eight se or each section, eight bars long. Uh, module 2-4, obviously at the end, even it specifies right here, uh, there's usually a two-bar break, which acts as a solo send-off. <clears throat> that break, uh, measure 30 in module 2-5, and um, that also being a pretty key harmonic peak. The form itself is 32 bars long for module 2, 6. Module 3, 2 talks about you know the style that it's usually played and uh, this is usually more of an upbeat tune than you know 132 listed here. Uh, but that said, usually played in a swung style medium up tempo I think is fair to say for some rhythm section contribution on this module 3 4 the impact of the rhythm section catching the end of these hits is a pretty common occurrence on this tune some of you guys brought up the fact that this is a pretty popular tune called a jam sessions and especially if you're playing with people that you maybe you don't know or you you know haven't had the experience of playing with or anything like that I think that would be a pretty safe thing to assume that everybody would kind of pop these ends of the melody together. It's so common, it's so known, I guess. It's kind of ingrained in our soul that almost be our natural instinct to do that. So again, the thought of the rhythm section reinforcing hits that are already in the melody. Something that I wrote down here as, you know, some maybe some fuel for ideas for composition and it's not something that I've experimented with yet uh, at least on this tune anyway and I should also point out that this particular tune 4 was the first piece that I've ever arranged it was when I was a junior in high school and we had this um, this assembly for you know, for the school that I went to and it was us and uh, our sister school like all the music students would put on a show together and this was the first arrangement that I ever did and I haven't revisited this tune uh, since that arrangement now which is oh my gosh maybe 20 years ago uh, so I haven't really thought about it from a writing perspective too much until uh, that so I figured I'd share you that quick story but um, a note that I had down here just going back to last semester with the Joe Henderson unit if, you know, for practice sake, the rhythm section is so used to catching those upbeats of two and upbeats of four. Think about how this chart would be if, say, the rhythm section approached it like Joe Henderson's tune, A Shade of Jade, where they play the tonality, whatever it happens to be, whatever the chord is, but it's not in line with where the rhythm sections play in melodies, right? So... The, or where the horns are playing the melody, excuse me. So there's a horn impact, up a two, up a four, up a two, up a four. You know, what if the rhythm section were playing something completely different? Maybe downbeat a one, upbeat a three. Maybe upbeat a one, downbeat a three. You know, anything that didn't align with the melody. And I thought that was a really cool thing from Shade of Jade. That's something that really stuck with me, where the rhythm section... The, the rhythm section themselves are hitting together, but it's not where the horns are necessarily hitting. And it was a really, uh, almost gave like a fighting back and forth sense. So I thought that would be a really interesting thing to hear on a chart like this that has such specific spots where I think people are used to hitting together. Um, as far as endings are concerned, module three, five, another thought for practice necessarily. Um, the ending to this tune, again, if you were just playing this and you never met the people or if you've been playing this for years, probably a good chance that you're just going to break at the end of this. Maybe, you know, at the end of it, something like that, and kind of fade out. Or there might just be a, a real break at the end. You know, boom, and then we're done. When you have a tune that has a really defined ending or a really popular ending, you should use that as fuel to create the alternate ending. You know, think about it with 
any DVDs that you watch or any movies. You know, films are made now with alternate endings. This has been going on for years. So, you know, you can think about arranging this way where you get done to the end and when you get to the end of the form, these alternate endings could be different jumping off points for developmental material for your piece. And they themselves could create their own entity. You know, just because this tune ends right here in E flat, well, maybe harmonically you have some different changes where maybe it resolves to A major 7 sharp 11, where E flat becomes the sharp 11. And all of a sudden now you're on A major 7 sharp 11, and that becomes its own modal section. Or maybe this B boo ba dee ba doo B doo dee doo dee, maybe rhythmically it becomes a 3 4 or a grouping to 3. Something like that. Uh, perhaps if it's melody, you can augment, you can diminish, you can, you can twist and pull it different ways. But the real key is not feeling so roped into the fact that you have to have a break at the end of this tune. When it is so iconic, it gives you the chance anyway to express a little bit more creativity. Um, a lot of cycle harmony. On the uh, on the bridge, now the Aversol doesn't list it this way, uh, but I am usually hearing the B seven happening on the second half of this bar. That resolution is kind of implied in the melody, um, but the Jamie doesn't specify that uh, that B seven chord right here. I don't know if any of you guys have played it that way, or if you normally play it as a true minor seven chord. Um, but yeah, I would say for the most part. Um, you know, there's more instances of cycle harmony than not. Um, and kind of along with that, the, I, I, this is, I, I think this is definitely a small semantic point here, but I'll make it anyway. Um, module four, six on chord substitutions. Uh, even if you had the B7 chord here, I, don't, I know that's obviously not a chord substitution, but what it does do is it would affect the harmonic rhythm. And as we've been talking about before, putting two chords in this measure almost makes this seem like an interjecting thought, more so than falling one bar minor seventh chords. This, in my opinion, gives you a little bit more, um, it's almost a little bit more palatable, maybe is the word that I'm looking for. It gives you a chance to internalize it a little bit more. With the B7 and needing to address that harmony, it to me just gives that little interjection of keeping you on your toes or like an interrupting thought almost to this series of, you know, two fives. You could think of it as a tritone sub almost, right? G minor seven, C seven, F seven, B flat seven. You could think of it, you know, whichever way. But I do think that, and again, this just comes from the way that I've learned this tune, this being a dominant seventh chord here, this B seven. That harmonic rhythm, I think, interrupts the flow of something like this. And not that one is better or worse than the other, but, you know, when you have chords, like a minor seventh chord that exists for the full bar, you do have the opportunity to put the corresponding five chord in there. It's not like you're affecting the tonality. They both come from the same sound. But putting in that extra chord can really alter the harmonic rhythm, which as we talked about before, it can create more motion or less motion if you decide to omit it. Um, again, the break being a harmonic peak at the end of the chart. Uh, the melody, uh, lyrical on this, I wouldn't say it's very, it's incredibly noty, but I would also say that the shapes are repeated here in module five, six, right? So the ascending line, ascending line coming down and then up the minor third. You have the same thing repeated here, just all up a fourth. Interesting, too, that the harmony goes up a second and the melody goes up a fourth. But it's still really the same pattern that's, uh, that's happening right here. And obviously there's some similarities in the melody uh, on the B and the C section as well. Maybe some slight modifications with regards to when certain notes come in. But uh, rhythmically, I would say uh, it, it's pretty similar. Uh, but you can definitely see how the shapes are tied in from one to the other. And that is what I have on four. Hope this enhances and, uh, you know, just goes along with the work that you guys have already put in on this. So thanks very much, and I'll see you on the next one.